begin with your song Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe Give us a greater glimpse of a never-changing God Till all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, found in you, oh, 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 oh. open wide our hearts now to yours. Every fear bow down to your love That we would see like never before Give us a greater glimpse of a never changing God All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, found in you, oh, 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 there is freedom In your presence we are made whole And in your presence there is freedom In your presence we are made whole Is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you, found in you. All we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Church by the Lake online. We're glad that you're with us today. We know that more and more you are wondering what reopening will look like for the church building. And let me tell you that if everything goes well with the reopening of the schools in September, then we plan to resume in-person worship services as well as youth groups and children's ministries on October the 1st. That is the date that we are currently working with. There's still much work to do, and so stay tuned for more details. Of course, there will be health regulations and protocols to follow. At the same time, we also plan to start live streaming our worship services in October. And so at that time, whether you're on site in the building or at home or traveling, you may stay connected in real time with us on Sunday mornings. Please pray for all those preparations. Secondly, this Friday will be the deadline for completing the Growing Young Assessment. We will send the email link again this afternoon in case you still need it. And speaking of email, you may contact Patty in the church office at middlesackville at eastlink.ca or by phone at 506-536-2615 with any inquiries or to be added to our weekly email newsletter list or to arrange offering envelopes, an e-transfer or pre-authorized debit. She'll be glad to hear from you. And we want to thank you 
for your faithful giving to the mission and ministry of the church. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. We hope you will worship the Lord with us. Here's a little bit more about what the Growing Young Assessment is all about. Today's young people have so much to offer. They are passionate, they raise important questions, they're eager to take action. If you're a young person, you know this already. And today's churches can become the best place for young people to grow, unleashing their potential to change the world. But none of this happens on accident. In fact, congregations today are seeing a growing divide between generations. Congregations are shrinking and aging, and many young people are walking away. Despite dismal trends nationwide, we've discovered hundreds of diverse, innovative churches engaging young people today. My name is Kara Powell. I'm a mom of teenagers, a church leader, and the executive director of the Fuller Youth Institute at Fuller Seminary. We've conducted research with hundreds of churches that are thriving with young people. Then we designed the Growing Young Assessment to help your congregation focus its next steps. Whatever your age or life stage, your leaders need to hear your voice. When you take the assessment, you'll spend a few minutes answering questions confidentially about your church. This is an invitation to be honest. This is an invitation from your leaders to join the conversation, to help your church identify areas of strength and growth. Because your voice matters. Help your church by taking the Growing Young Assessment today.
Actions speak louder than words. Have you ever heard or used that old saying? It's especially true if your primary love language is acts of service. Doing something you know the other person would like for you to do is an expression of love. And you know, the list of possible acts of service is endless. Cooking a meal, or washing the dishes, or vacuuming the floors, or mowing the grass, or cleaning the grill, or giving the dog a bath, or painting a bedroom, washing the car, driving a sixth grader to soccer practice, sewing a doll dress, or putting the chain back on a bicycle. If your primary love language is acts of service, then just words, no matter how loving, may fall a bit flat if not accompanied by action. And so the husband might say, I love you. And she might be thinking, if he loved me, he would pitch in more around this place. Gary Chapman writes, he may be sincere in his words of affirmation, but he's missing her emotionally because her language is acts of service. And without it, she does not feel loved. Or a wife gives her husband a gift. But if his love language is acts of service, he's left wondering, why does she spend her time cleaning the house instead of shopping for the so-called perfect gift? The same can be said of other relationships too. A failure to understand the other person's primary love language, whether it's a spouse or a child or a teenager, a parent, a friend, a neighbor, a colleague or a coworker, will cause the other person to wonder whether we really love them because emotionally we are not understanding that person. You could say that something gets lost in translation, but when we speak their love language, they are drawn to us because we are meeting their basic need to feel loved. The problem in many of our human relationships is that we speak our own love language and we wonder why the other person does not understand. Human relationships are greatly enhanced when we learn to speak the other person's love language. And so before we go any further, do you know what your primary love language even is? Is it words of affirmation? Is it quality time? Is it gifts? Is it acts of service? Is it physical touch? You probably have an idea, but like me, you want to be more certain. Well, there's a quiz for that. And I want to encourage you to follow the link on your screen to take a free quiz to discover your primary love language, whether you are a couple or a teenager or a child or a single person. Okay, so assuming you know what your love language is, let's talk a bit more about acts of service. And by the way, this message is for everyone because acts of service is either your love language or the love language of someone close to you. You cannot escape acts of service. Last week, when we were looking at gifts, I told you that, of course, the ultimate expression of God's gift giving is the cross. And it's there at the cross that we see the love language of gifts spoken most fluently. What God has done for you offsets any difficulty you may ever have for the rest of your life. He cherishes you and he owns you not to put you in debt, but to free you from debt. He bought you back. He redeemed you not with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of his son. When he was forced to choose between an eternity without you and eternity with you, he said, you know what? I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that you are with me. And so Jesus Christ went to the cross. And when he accomplished the task, when Christ's work was done on the cross, when justice was had and when God's mercy and love and grace were fully extended, he rightly said, it is finished. What a gift. Perhaps you can sense where I might be going with this now. And that is to say that it's really difficult to silo or compartmentalize the love languages. You cannot easily separate them. And so God knew our need and he sent Jesus to us. What a gift. Jesus Christ died on the cross for humanity's sin and for my sins and your sins. What a gift. And what a tremendous act of service. See what I mean?
But what else does the Bible have to say about acts of service? Well, I want you to consider the miracles that Jesus performed for people. They were never um, capricious. They were always expressions of love for people. Healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, calming the storm, casting out demons, and on three occasions, raising the dead, these were clearly supernatural feats, identifying Jesus with God, and were done as expressions of his love. This was made especially clear in his statement to his followers when he said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And so let's turn to John chapter 9 as we consider one of these miracles. This is Jesus healing a man born blind. And I want to read it for you now. It will be on your screen. John 9, beginning at verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. And so the man went and washed and came home seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? They asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and washed, and so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. At this point, the Pharisees are called to investigate the healing because the day in which Jesus performed this act of service was a Sabbath. And so we pick up at verse 17. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard 
that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word this morning. Would it be fair to say that the man gained more than one kind of sight that day? Not only did he have his physical eyes open, but his spiritual eyes were open too as a result of Jesus' loving act of service. He saw the most important thing. He saw Jesus. And you know, that's what the pastors and leaders here at the church by the lake desire for us all. That's what we want for you. If you look closely at John 9, you can actually see the man's progression in terms of discovering who Jesus was. And so in verse 11, we find that at first, all the blind man knew of his healer was that he was the man they call Jesus. A few verses later in 17, the man confesses to the Pharisees that this Jesus was a prophet. The opposition, however, were not satisfied. In verse 33, the man is exasperated and he strengthens his previous confession and he becomes a staunch defender of Jesus to the Pharisees. And he tells them, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then by, by the time verse 38 rolls around, the man sees Jesus as the Son of Man, the Son of God, and rightly worships him saying, Lord, I believe. He calls him Lord. And so the light that poured into the man's new physical eyes was really nothing compared to the light that dawned in his soul. The more he sought after Jesus, the more obvious it became that Jesus was not just a man or even just a prophet. He was his Lord, the one who has power over human fate, who changes human destiny as he continues the Father's work. And not only can Jesus restore sight to the body, physical eyes, but better yet, he can give spiritual vision to a man who seemed to be the victim of an unjust fate, an unjust life. You know, I have to wonder how many around us right here in our own families or workplaces or churches and among our friends and neighbors are in need of receiving a loving act of service. Perhaps it's been a while since they experienced love in their own language. And so affirming words, as great as they are, have fallen a bit flat. And quality time, as good as it is, hasn't renewed their spirit. And gifts, even those of great material value, have not stirred them. And they're neither seeking a hug nor a pat on the back. No, some of the people nearest us are in need of receiving a loving act of service because their primary love language is acts of service. And we are the ones, I'm the one, and you are the one to make it happen. And as you recognize that and put that into action, you should know that when you serve others in Jesus' name, it's like you're serving God himself. And can I add one more thing? And that is that as we go about our daily routines, you know, it's really easy to get bogged down and take our eyes off the future. This world is not our home. And Jesus, through another loving act of service, has already gone ahead to prepare eternity for those who believe. Listen to the words of John 14, 1 to 3. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So, if you have not yet, will you put your trust in the one who prepares the way? The one who, when forced, to choose between an eternity without you and an eternity with you, said, I'll do whatever it takes. Will you follow Jesus, the one who seeks us and reaches us with wonderful and loving acts of service? Will you follow Jesus today? 
Lord, thank you for loving us. And thank you for doing so through loving acts of service so that we may grow deeper in our love for you and be a blessing to others. Help us to be sensitive to the primary love language of each of our family members and friends and coworkers and neighbors. We desire to be the presence of love in the lives of others, modeled after Jesus himself. In his name, in Jesus' name, amen. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God, you have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus, our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God, you have done great things You'll be faithful forevermore You have done great things And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Great. 